On February the 27th, 1995, the bodies of Cheryl Feeney and her two young children, Tyler, age six, and Jennifer, one and a half, would be found. They were brutally murdered in their home while John Feeney, Cheryl's husband, was 90 miles away at a work conference. With a staged crime scene that made it look like a gang-related home invasion, John's lack of an alibi and an extramarital affair, he would be the only person to ever be named as a suspect. This case took so many turns, but it is still unsolved. This is dated August the 9th, 2021. Over 20 years later, and the story of the Feeney family murders remains an unsolved mystery in the Ozarks. The year was 1995. One weekend in February, John Feeney, a science teacher at Glendale High School, claims he was at a work conference in the Lake of the Ozarks. That same weekend, his family, his wife Cheryl, six-year-old son Tyler, and 18-month-old daughter Jennifer were murdered in their home in southwest Springfield. On the following Monday, news broke about the death of these three family members. The victims were discovered by John's mother, Ola, and a co-worker of Cheryl's. Police said Tyler and Cheryl died from multiple wounds to the face and neck, likely caused by a metal pipe. And baby Jennifer was found with a cord from a curtain rod tied around her neck. Um, this is just horrific. It's horrific. And it's even more horrific to think that maybe the father of these children would brutalize them in that way. It's one thing to murder somebody. Um, if you want out of your marriage, you know, these people are, are known to, to go to that extreme. Um, but unless the six-year-old boy was awake when this took place, when his mother was murdered, what was the reason to murder him? Did this man do this? Is this the theory of police and others that he just murdered all three of them? because he didn't want to have anything to do with the family anymore and he just wanted out. But most people would say he had to do it in a brutal way to make it look like that it was some attack from some horrible, sinister people. Um, because if he had just simply gone in and, and killed the wife and then suffocated the children, very much like... Um, Chris Watts did to his children, then that might make it look a little bit more like the father of these children had a little bit of mercy on them, you know? I'm not saying that he was even involved. I'm just saying that to think that he could have been the one to do this to an 18-month-old baby who could not speak or identify the killer. So what was the purpose of killing the baby other than to just be rid of any links to this family, you know? So this is the writer of this story, um, Robert Keyes, a Springfield News leader reporter. I went to the crime scene. I went out there, and you know, it was a nice neighborhood, so that struck me as odd. It was such a nice neighborhood in southwest Springfield, you wouldn't expect this kind of violence. The reporter learned of the murders from a Missouri State Highway patrolman who found John at the conference. As authorities began to investigate, the South Central Missouri Major Case Squad was asked to help. A spokesperson with the squad said in March of 1995 that Feeney could be a potential witness. However, nearly one week after the killing, no one was arrested. Nearly 30 investigators from several law enforcement agencies worked that week to track down leads and contact family and friends and co-workers. While the investigation at his home continued, John stayed with his relatives. April the 22nd, 1996, 
420 days after the murders, the Greene County Grand Jury hands down a third degree, first degree murder count, three first degree murder counts against John Feeney. On September the 24th, 1996, the trial of John Feeney began with jury selection that lasted three days. Opening statements began on September the 27th. Prosecutors told jurors that on the night of February the 26th, 1995, John Feeney drove to Springfield from the teacher's convention at the Lake of the Ozarks and murdered his family. I was kind of struck by how the prosecution case just wasn't overwhelming, said Keyes. I mean, it was very strong circumstantial evidence, but there were so many different layers. Those, later, those layers include a game Feeney played called Vampires of the Masquerade. Investigators found game sheets in Feeney's classroom at, in his desk at Glendale High School. Prosecutors said Feeney took the vampire game to the extreme and used it to assume the role of the killer and wiped out his family. A friend of Feeney's, Matt Farley, engaged in role-playing games with Feeney for more than a decade. He told the court he never saw Feeney play the vampire game and Feeney steered clear of murderer roles. Prosecutors also brought up Feeney's sexual involvement with another teacher. Tyler Feeney having hepatitis B and Feeney taking out an additional $250,000 life insurance policy on his wife just five months before the murder. He took out this life insurance policy on his wife. I don't know why his son, are they saying that he had hepatitis B because it was transmitted? from the father to the mother from another from a sexual relationship that he had had um, KOLR 10 News attended every day of the trial Cheryl Feeney and her two children six year old Tyler and 18 month old Jennifer were at their home in southwest Springfield Cheryl was really getting freaked out I don't can you call me back they said you're not at work Murder was darker than others he had covered as a reporter. I mean, they always take, you know, 
murder seriously. But with this one, it was like you could tell right away that this one has some different elements in it that we would later learn. You know, the way that the the crime scene was staged, the way that the bodies had been had been killed. Day began with a look at the murder victims. Prosecutors showed the jury pictures taken the day of the murder. The evidence brought John Feeney to tears. Feeney became emotional once again when prosecutors played back the family's answering machine tape. Prosecutors say there's three calls from John Feeney on the answering machine. Two on Sunday the 26th and Monday the 27th. There's nine messages from concerned family and uh, friends. And the tenth call on the machine is from John. Keep in mind this was before the days when everyone in the world had a cell phone and it was readily able to message people through text and these other apps. Prosecutor Safini was the last to check on his family because he already knew that they were dead. During the trial, the defense called more than a dozen witnesses to testify on John Feeney's character and demeanor at the Lake of the Ozarks the weekend of the murders. The, fe the defense witnesses told the court Feeney was a good husband and father. He acted sincerely shaken when he found out what happened to his family. On October the 5th, 1996, an eight-man, four-woman jury found John Feeney not guilty of murdering his wife and two young children. Feeney was not completely in the clear at this point. The following November, his in-laws filed a wrongful death suit against him. Cheryl Feeney's parents had sued to prevent John from recovering financial gain from the death of his family. The lawsuit did not last very long as Cheryl's parents dropped the filing at the end of November. By then, the story of John Feeney and who had murdered his family began to fade away. So they dropped this lawsuit. They probably didn't figure that since he was, they probably assumed that since he was found not guilty, there would have been no reason for the uh, insurance company to say, no, we will not pay this out, this life insurance out. That's my theory, anyway. 28 years later, the Feeney family murder remains less popularly known, but it also remains unsolved. There wasn't a lot done on the Feeney, so that's why I think people are intrigued by this. Um, one of the key sources featured in the story is a woman named Teresa who wished to be only known by her first name. Teresa was a friend of Cheryl's from work, and she was the one who identified the three bodies during the initial household visit. When Cheryl did not arrive to work on time on Monday, February the 27th, 1995, Teresa became worried. It was very unusual for Cheryl not to be at work. Teresa took it upon herself to visit the Feeney household where she found the front door unlocked and the home was in disarray. She called 911 and was with the police officer when he discovered the bodies in the bedrooms. Some local journalists like Ron Davis just gave me a ton of documents because he was covering the case quite extensively at the time. He, prevented me, he presented me with this really amazing binder full of things that he had collected about the case. Ann Rodriguez Jones, the, the person that runs this podcast, went to meet with Lynn Hash, who was Cheryl Feeney's mother, for the interview. Uh, I think this would be a very interesting podcast. I'm going to keep this page open and come back and listen to it later. Rodriguez Jones said she reached out to both John and his attorney, but neither accepted her request to participate. Um, 
At the end of the day, they were just trying to answer one question. Was John the killer? Did John escape these consequences, or is he an innocent man who suffered with, from this unimaginable loss? John left Springfield for a high school science conference at Tan Tar A Estates at Lake of the Ozarks. John was a chemistry teacher at Glendale High School and spoke at the conference. According to previous news leader reporting, despite his statement of being absent from Springfield during the time of his family's murder, John was identified as police as the only suspect. Cameras around people's homes in 1996 and 1995 were probably very, very limited if, if people had cameras at all. They say this was a very nice, quiet neighborhood where the Springfield, where this family was murdered. It wasn't known to be a high crime rate, not a lot of break-ins or anything like that. That's probably the one thing that gave the police the idea that the father was behind this. Is it possible that the father hired someone to go in there and kill his family while he was out of town? so that he wouldn't be accused. Did the police look at that angle? Did they question anyone else in the neighborhood if they saw a strange car or if they heard any strange noises? Did they question anyone at the conference to say, at around this time of night, did you actually see this man there? Were there cameras at this estate, this Lake of the Ozarks where he was staying? Did anyone see him leaving and coming back? Um, this wasn't a, this was not a time when people generally put cameras up all around. You know, the the probability of them. I, I mean, I I don't know if they searched for any type of DNA. Did they say if this woman had been sexually assaulted or was she just murdered? Did they search for DNA? Did they search for fingerprints? Um, you know, how how did this person gain entry into the home? Was the door broken in? Did they keep this evidence over the years to come back later and put DNA into CODIS or anything of that nature? If they found any blood, blood or DNA or anything else at the crime scene, it doesn't say that here. It had to have been just... It had to have been someone emotionless, a sociopath, who could do that to a baby. The six-year-old could very possibly have been murdered due to the fact that he could possibly have identified who the person was. Did they question anyone else in the neighborhood? Men, who, did they check background records of any of the neighbors? to see if anybody living in that area had a background, a history of violence or anything like that. I listened to a lot of podcasts and videos about this story. There's so many articles about it, but the thing is, there's so little information about the actual crime scene. I couldn't find anything really where the, any police officers were interviewed and told about going to the crime scene and what it looked like. The wife and the little boy had been beaten to death and um, the little girl had been strangled with a cord. The child was only a year and a half old. There was no way for her to be able to identify who did this, so her murder is probably one of the biggest reasons why people believed it was him because so many women were called in who came forward and said that they'd had affairs with him for years he had been cheating on his wife and they they also told that he really didn't have any feeling toward his son he was like very distant and standoffish when talking about his son and Many people believe he did this for money because he had life insurance policies. They wanted to prevent him from collecting because they believed him to be the killer. And he was found not guilty 
but I couldn't see anything, you know, and like I said in all these articles that I read and, and listened to podcasts, there was really nothing that told about any police investigation of anybody else. The The most, the strangest thing about all of this, and I think this was strange to everybody, was when the little boy, when the autopsies were done, the little boy, six years old, was found to have hepatitis B. Now, most people automatically assumed that the father was abusing the child and that he had transmitted this hepatitis to his son because of all these affairs that he was having with all these different women. But he was tested. I think they said he was actually tested twice, and he did not test positive for hepatitis. The mother did not test positive for hepatitis when they did her autopsy. So people began to wonder if the child had been abused by someone else and had contracted hepatitis B from the abuser. So I asked the question, did they test members of the family? You know, um, how wide is the social circle of a six-year-old child? Um, was Did he go to daycare did they test any of his teachers at his school? Um, uncles, cousins, next door neighbors, anyone like that who may have spent time with the child alone to, to determine if he may have contracted hepatitis B from one of these people. They did go to the local health department and they came up with around 150 names of people in the community who had been tested and found to be positive for hepatitis B and they tried to like um, narrow down any of those people who would have had contact with this family who may have spent time with them but I don't think that they were really ever able to find anything to lead them to determine if the child had been abused. The autopsy said that it was inconclusive so, a lot of people wondered if maybe the reason that the child was, that this family was murdered was because this, when the child maybe had become sick and the mother found out about this and was getting ready to name a name, you know, maybe the child had told her, you know, someone had molested him and that person, maybe she confronted them and they may have murdered her and the children. But I think when everybody really thought about it and really looked at the evidence and looked at everything, most people came to the decision that the father did this. Now, he was an hour and a half away at a conference, and unless someone came forward and witnessed and said, well, I was with him the whole time from the time that, you know, I first we, we all first arrived there until... The police came and woke him up to, you know, that he was told that his family were found dead. I think that there's a possibility that sometime during the night, after everyone at this conference had gone to their rooms to go to sleep, it's possible that he drove this hour and a half to his home. His family were probably in their beds asleep. This is where they were found. They were all in their beds asleep. He probably came into the house, murdered them, got back in his car and drove the hour and a half back and was gone a total of maybe four hours before, you know, the, the next morning when everybody started stirring around. I don't know. That's just thoughts. And that's what a lot of people still believe to this day. And he was, he was put on trial he was exonerated, he, he was found not guilty, and he collected this insurance money. I looked for anything on him after this. I looked for any information I could find to see what he went on to do with his life after. And I couldn't really find too much about him. Um, 
there may be some more information on some of the podcasts that I didn't get to listen to, but it's still an unsolved case. I don't know if the police consider it to be a cold case, if they have reopened it at any point, or if they really ever intend to. And um, so as of right now, I don't know if this man is still alive. He... He was 36 when this happened, and this was 30 years ago, so it's possible that he is still alive, and he may have remarried and maybe even had other children, I don't know. Thanks for watching.